welcome to Sunday Assembly Los Angeles. I'm Amy. And I'm Gina, and we're going to be your MCs today. Um, at Sunday Assembly, we are a God-free community that celebrates a worldview grounded in evidence and reason. And today we want to invite all of you to celebrate life with us as we live better, help, help often, often, and wonder, wonder more. more. Our yeah. Our theme today is be part of the solution. Uh, all of our speakers will be talking uh, a lot about uh, the different ways that it's possible for us to take a bite out of the big problems and how together we can work toward fighting for real change. Uh, so I have something to confess and it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, I get really uncomfortable when the front two rows of the auditorium are not completely full. I get really uncomfortable when Amy's uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, I, when I stray from our script, she gets real <laughs> mad. Uh, so if you guys could move forward and fill these holes in the, in the very front, I would really appreciate it. It would make me feel so much better. We've got like one over here and two yeah. over there. We have an amazing awesome. audience. You guys are great. happening. That was super cool. Now, if you have an empty seat next to you right now, could you raise your hand? And if your hand is in the air, could you stand up? And if that empty seat is toward the center aisle, could you move toward the center aisle so our ushers will be able to seat people along the edges? That was tricky. Yeah, but it was awesome. I have never <laughs> seen a, a crowd do that so well before. You guys are great. <laughs> All right, cool. So we're going to kick things off, and I want to introduce to you someone who is amazing. I'm so excited. Paul Svensson is here. He's going to be our song leader today. We stole him from Sunday Assembly San Diego. We Thank went down guys. there, and we're like, we have to have this. we got to get it up here. Go San Diego. Um, we also have a few people who have volunteered to be a little group we're going to call the Wonder More Warblers, and they're going to come up on stage um, now as well and help us sing along the first two songs, because the only thing better than one song is two songs. Um, so here's Paul. All right. Good morning, LA! <laughs> Sorry, I've always wanted to do that. So I've been told that this is a pretty good singing group, am I right? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I spent oh, about 40 years of my life as a church music leader, and, um, and I retired from that, and now I'm here. Uh, and, and one of the things that we had in church was we had great music. I mean, there was great music. And then there's the whole atheist, agnostic, free thought Sunday assembly community, and we got nothing. We got nothing, except Steve Martin sol solved that problem for us with a little piece that he has called, Atheists Don't Have No Songs. Now, this was originally done as a bluegrass um, gospel piece. We're going to apply it to you. You sing the part that's in blue, or anything else you like, but it goes like this. Well, Christians had their hymns and pages. Habanagilas for the Jews. Baptists had the Rock of Ages. Atheists just sing the blues. Romantics play Claire de Lune. Born again, sing, he is, he is risen, but no one ever wrote a tune for godless existentialism, existentialism. Oh, I heard some harmony, very nice. For atheists, there's no good news, they never sing a song of faith. In their songs they have a rule The he is always lower K Sing that with us The he is always lower K Well, some folks sing A Bach cantata Have Christmas trees Atheist song Add up to nada But they do have Sundays free. Have Sunday. 
Well, Pentecostals sing, they sing to heaven. Coptics have their book of scrolls. Numerologists count, numerologists count, count to seven. Atheists have rock and roll. Rock and For atheists, there's no good news. They'll never sing song of faith. In their songs, they have a rule. The he is always lower. Give me some of that good harmony. The he is always lower case. Those Christians have their hymns and pages. Havana Gila's for the Jews. Them Baptists have the rock of ages. Atheists. Catholics dress up for mass and listen to Gregorian chants. Atheists just take a pass, watch football in their underpants. Watch football in their underpants. Atheists, atheists. Yeah, good singing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we're going to have to have you stand up now. Woo! Enough of this sitting on the... So, uh, you could have told me, oh, a month ago, you could have asked me if I thought I would ever learn a 1979 New Wave song by the Buggles. And I'd have gone, mm, probably not. Can't say that anymore. <laughs> now this is easy to sing because it's only two notes for the most part. And you gotta get very staccato, y'all with me. Here we go, people at home, you sing along too. I heard you on the wireless back in 52. Lying awake intent and tuning down on you. If I was young, it didn't stop you coming through. Oh, oh. They took the credit for your second symphony. Rewritten by machine and new technology. And now I understand the problem. Sing it now. Oh, oh. I met your children. Oh, oh. What did you tell them? Video kill, come on, radio star. And broke your heart. Oh, 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 oh. And now we meet in an abandoned studio. We hear the playback, and it seems so long ago. And you remember when we used to go. Oh, oh, you were the first one. For the last one, video kill the radio star. Video kill the radio star. In my mind and in my car. Can you not too far? Video killed the radio 
star. Good singing. Wow, that was amazing. Wasn't that great, you guys? Can we hear it for Paul again? And we had spontaneous um, jump in to come sing with us. And if anybody gets that feeling later on and wants to do that again, please feel free to do so. We, we are here not singing the right notes, trying to make you feel more comfortable. Yes. So. <laughs> Uh, so today's guest speaker will be talking a lot about the media. Uh, we happen to have a brand new volunteer video team that is taking our video here at Sunday Assembly to the next level. So if you um, want to check out our YouTube channel, we have a YouTube channel, or our social media, you will see that we are now broadcast, we're now posting full length videos of assemblies within one week of every assembly. It's amazing. It's a big promise, but that's what we're doing and fully edited clips of each shareable segment of the assemblies. Uh, and you also might see that Bruce Gleason has a lot of really fancy equipment Hi, back Bruce. there. <laughs> uh, with that, if you're wondering what he is up to, with that we are actually able to live stream the entire assembly today so that people all over the world can be a part of our assembly. Pretty cool, yep. right? So, Good job. Hi. So we want to give a shout out to our friends and other Sunday assemblies. Uh, I'm not sure who's all watching and tweeting, but I know I've seen uh, San Diego and Baltimore and Newcastle out there. So hi, guys. Welcome. <laughs> OK, that's not freaking me out at all. Mm -mm, not, no, not no at pressure. All. <laughs> so anyway, our program today is going to be a little bit over an hour. And at the end of our program, we'll have coffee and snacks in the back, which is a great time to socialize and meet people. And then after that, if you're game, we go across the street for the Oinkster, um, to the Oinkster to have lunch. Um, they also have vegetarian options. So we'll be doing that later. Today, we're collecting items for our Sunday assembly line project, which some of you may remember we did once before. Um, they're little bags that we put together um, to serve the homeless community here in Los Angeles. So if anybody brought items today, the urgently needed items are like two toothpaste, deodorant, soap, hand sanitizer, things like that. We'll be collecting those. Uh, and for next month at our November 8th assembly, we'll be, we will be collecting items for a different kind of care package. Uh, these will be for non-religious people in the military. Uh, these are folks that face a fierce amount of religious discrimination, and we would like to show our support. So they're requesting uh, card games, books, personal letters, and snacks. Sadly, not chocolate, because it tends to melt in transit. Uh, you can bring those in care packages in Ziploc bags, or you can bring the loose items, and we will package them. We're going to mail everything for you. We just ask that you do not seal the boxes. Uh, and if you'd like to find out more about that issue, we happen to have a very special event this Tuesday that we're co-hosting with CFI uh, about the specific challenges that non-religious people in the military face. We invite you to join us at 8 p.m. on Tuesday. You can RSVP for that on our website or in the lobby. Cool. All right, that's going to be great. Um, so it's time for milestones. This is one of my favorite parts where we celebrate things that are going on with people in the community. So the first milestone I want to mention is our kids' art enrichment program that just kicked off last Sunday. This is really awesome. It's for kids ages 10 through um, 16. Russell Orell and Sean Clausius were um, kicking that off. And they're working on performance and video and planning projects. And hopefully, they're going to be performing at Solstice. Is that yeah. the plan? That's going to be awesome. So you can learn more about that on our website. It's under the kids banner. You can check that out. It's a really, really cool, really exciting program. So we can't wait to see what happens there. Uh, and next, Sam and Tammy bought their first home. Awesome. <laughs> At after two months of renovation, they will be moving in at the end of this month. Congratulations, you two. Very cool. Um, Janet Kirker, hi Janet, is moving to New York this Wednesday. And she'll, we'll be seeing her maybe on the live stream for Sunday Assembly New York, possibly. Yay. Congratulations. Yay. Janet was an organizer with us for a while, and we wish her well in New York. That's going to be so exciting. Uh, next, Avery Williams, uh, son of Josh, and Kendall will be 15 on October 16th. Happy birthday, Avery. Yay. <laughs> Do you have more? 
<laughs> okay, last item. Bobby Kirkhart lost her car fob um, last assembly. So if, I guess if anybody has found anything, if you could get that turned in, maybe at the merchandise table? It's like, yeah, yeah. It's like a milestone. It's a similar yeah. thing. Kind of a milestone. <laughs> a milestone of loss and grief. Yeah. But hopefully we'll find it. That's what a community is for. We're here for each other in these moments. Totally here to support you. <laughs> Oh, something? yeah, yeah, I got okay. something. I got okay. stuff. Cool. Hey, kids, it's mm -hmm. time for Sunday Assembly Kids to convene. So if you are taking advantage of our free child care program, uh, please meet our caregivers in the lobby. Ian will walk them into the lobby. Uh, your children will be returned to you. This is a loaner program. Uh, and today, uh, the, we're actually going to do something different and bring the kids back before the last song so that they could be a part of that with us. So they will be returned earlier than usual. Our last song is so awesome that we don't want the kids to miss it. True. So, okay, now it's time to get to know your neighbor. So our icebreaker today, um, we're going to put an icebreaker screen up, and then we'll put a secondary screen up when it's over so you know when it's time to sh and come back over here. Okay, got it? All right, so today we're gonna play rock, paper, scissors. We're gonna do a two out of three. So um, when we get the screen up, I'm gonna ask y'all to turn, find somebody next to you, hopefully someone you don't already know, introduce yourself, two out of three rock, paper, scissors, and then we'll talk to you in a minute. Go. I know we promised you a slide. I know it'll happen. I'm psychic that way. Yay. <laughs> That's, that one's from Michael. OK, everyone, finish your conversations. Thank you for breaking the ice. Um, I am very excited to invite a member of our community, Marsha Swallow up here to share a poem with us. Thank you, Marsha. I'm taller than her. <laughs> okay. Um, First They Came by Pastor Martin Niemöller. First they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Thank you, Marsha. Um, so, on the topic of speaking up, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Our guest speaker today is Juan Placone. Um, he's a great friend of mine, and he is here to challenge the way that we, the people, interact with the news and with the media. He's the co-host of the Indie Bohemians Morning Show in Nashville, Tennessee, which is one of the very few independent morning shows left on the dial. He also serves as adjunct faculty at Nashville State Community College, so please join me in welcoming Ron Placone. All right. All right. First of all, uh, thanks for having me uh, before I kick in here. I, I really, uh, you know, whenever I have conversations with people about, like, just the concept of religion and all that, I say, you know, a lot of different religions have infringed on people's lives in ways that have not been positive. You know the only thing atheists have ever done to infringe on people's lives? Four years ago, they offered them a free Bad Religion concert. That's it. That's all they've done. But anyway, uh, so... 
My show is called Madness in the Message. It's, it's a topic that I speak about at colleges, and I speak about media and media policy and the media reform movement, which is a topic that a, a lot of people aren't familiar with. Sometimes I get some eyebrow raises and stuff like that, and, and people are just like, what's the problem? Like, the, my news anchor grew up down the street from me. They were great. What is, what's, the, what's the issue? Uh, and it's a little more complicated than that is the way I explain it to people. Just for the record, uh, the local news anchor in my town grew up down the street from me too. His name was Mike. He was a great guy and good at his job. The problem is not the journalists or the newsmakers or the people uh, that are working in the industry. The problem is the structure that we've set up in regards to how the media works. The media structure that we have in the United States uh, is very toxic to the idea of democracy, uh, and it, it's just not conducive to it at all. I mean, trying to have a democratic society and having our media set up the way it is, that's like trying to open a gourmet restaurant and cooking exclusively with spam. It's not impossible. <laughs> but it's not really advisable. So, so I go and I speak a lot about this. And the first thing we need to recognize here is that media is a very powerful entity. I have two novels in, in the back behind me, 1984 by George Orwell, uh, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Media theorists conclude, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with both of them, they're both dystopian, uh, where people are pretty much controlled. George Orwell, they're controlled by force. Aldous Huxley, they're more controlled by being kind of amused to death. And media theorists say that Huxley was kind of the correct foreshadower when it comes to media, because we are so distracted, there's so much going on, we are just uh, losing control of our society society and are just passively accepting it. Because media is incredibly powerful. Uh, media is all around us, and we count on these secondhand messages to frame our perspective on the world. How do we behave? How do we engage? How do we consume? How do we vote? We count on the media for all that. And because these are secondhand messages, the media can manipulate our viewpoint. That is called power. That's a very powerful thing. So. How did I get into all this? When I was in college, uh, I started to be more civically engaged than I ever was before. I started to learn more things, I was exposed to new ideas, and around that time, the United States was engaging in conflict with Iraq. And I was very confused and I had a lot of questions. I was not sure why we were there. These weapons of mass destruction never turned up anywhere. Uh, and the thing that confused me the most was the way that the media was responding to all this. I kind of thought that they were just parroting uh, talking points from the Bush administration. Turns out they were, by the way, if any of you guys remember uh, what ended up being revealed there, that was what was going on. And that confused me greatly. I thought the media was supposed to hold powers that be accountable, and it seemed like what they were concerned about most was how cool the president would be to have a beer with, as opposed to what was really going on. Sadly, in a lot of ways, uh, not much has changed, but that's a different story. Uh, so this concerned me greatly. I was like, why is this going on? Now, on my campus, there was a media arts resource center that was concerned with these ideas. And I went there, and I learned a lot about the media that I didn't know about. First of all, I learned about who really owns the media. Our media is owned by a very small, elite, powerful group of corporations, among them CBS, Viacom, News Corp. And these companies are constantly consolidating and conglomerating. Uh, that's why there's a term that I never use anymore, and that term is mainstream mainstream media, I don't say that, because there's nothing mainstream about an organization that is owned by such a small, elite group of people. There's nothing, this is mainstream media, because it's me talking to you, we're both uh, tangible, we both have ideas, there's nothing mainstream about our media. I don't use this term anymore, I instead use the term corporate media, simply because, definitionally, that is what it is. That's what we're dealing with. And when you have uh, such a skewed ownership, you're going to have a basic conflict of interest that occurs regularly. Uh, I was talking about the Iraq conflict, why I was so confused by that. General Electric is one of the larger media uh, companies in this country. They also have financial incentives to make defense weapons. This is not a conspiracy. This is a very textbook, basic example of a tragic conflict of interest. If other countries were doing this, and, and some of them do, but if other countries, if we had a case model where other countries were doing stuff where, hey, you know, the people that control the media also make money making bombs, we would be the first to point the finger at that. Yet, when we do it, when the United States do it, it's just considered business as usual. This is backwards. Uh, and this is a huge conflict of interest. But the biggest problem is not just 
the, uh, the, the skewed ownership that goes on in the media. The biggest problem is the business model we allow these companies to adhere to. I, I want to share this quick story. I, I do occasionally teach um, at a community college. One day there was a big campus fair going on. And some of my students were like, hey, can we check it out? There's a bunch of food there. I love free food as much as the next person. Any instructor does, I tell them that. But, uh, but I told them, I was like, okay, here's the deal. Because I, I teach speech comm. I was like, here's the deal. Uh, you guys have to, you can go for a little bit. You have to bring enough food for everybody, first of all. Secondly, uh, there's a lot of different groups out there. Campus groups, environmental groups, the Republicans, the Democrats, everyone's out there. You gotta go speak to some people. You gotta learn some stuff. And then they're gonna do a speech about what you learned. Okay, cool, that's a good deal, Ron. That's what they said. They come back, they, they knocked the food part out of the park. They had, they, they had so much, I don't know how they got, uh, someone gave them a tray, it was nuts. Uh, and then I was like, okay, guys, part two, uh, what'd you learn? And it's like I just shone my headlights on a couple deer. I know some of you guys are teachers, you know what I'm talking about, they kind of just looked at each other. One student spoke up and he was like, oh, they were pretty much packing up and getting ready to go. We didn't get to talk to anyone. I was like, okay. I went to the campus fair after class, a little bit of misreporting from my students. They were out there, people were passing out flyers. I said, hey, uh, my students said that you guys were leaving. And someone was like, who are your students? I described them. They were like, I saw two students that matched that description that grabbed a big tray from over there, filled it up with food, and left right away. Uh, I saw that. So my point in bringing this up, my students were skewed by their main agenda, which was hunger, right? The media is also skewed by their main agenda, which is profit. The media's main focus, their number one priority is profit. They make no qualms about that. Jeff Zucker will attest to that. The president of CNN, Rupert Murdoch, is no different. And when profit is your main concern, uh, you will inevitably make some decisions that are unethical and that are very compromising to a healthy media structure. First of all, the first department that is cut on a regular basis is journalism. It's to the point where journalism is no longer a sustainable living. Uh, secondly, a lot of times content is compromised when it does not fit the advertiser's point of view. You see this a lot in the oil and gas industry. They're a main advertiser on corporate media. Environmental stories are often uh, neglected and pushed under the rug way more than than they should be. And also sensationalism and hyperbole uh, will favor actual news and actual information that people need to know. One of my favorite examples to talk about in regards to that is when the MH370 plane went missing. I'm sure you guys remember that. When that event happened, CNN went on a near nonstop coverage of that. Pretty much 24-7, they were on loop talking about the plane and uh, about how the plane was missing. They neglected any other story that was going on. Uh, why did they do this? It wasn't because they had any new information to share. It's because they prefaced everything with the phrase breaking news. So you would see something come up on the screen or you'd see an article online, breaking news regarding MH370. And you're gonna click that article and you're gonna stay engaged. You're gonna sit through those commercials. Why? Because you're gonna think that the plane was found. If it's breaking news and it's concerning this plane, you're gonna think they found it. They never found it. It would just pan to four people talking about where it might have landed. It was basically adults playing with model airplanes on television. That's breaking news in the United States. But it was coined as such because what they were trying to do was inflate their ratings for that period. They wanted people to stay engaged. Wolf Blitzer even called him out on that. He was like, they were trying to make that be the Super Bowl of their year. When NBC airs the Super Bowl, they see a big spike in their ratings and then it makes the average higher for the year. CNN was trying to have MH370 be their Super Bowl. It was very irresponsible journalism. Also, uh, I mentioned, um, I mentioned how sometimes when the advertisers don't like a certain point of view, you don't see that uh, being presented as well. I did my master's degree in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, that is the capital of a process known as fracking. What that is, is it's a, it's a process where they extract oil and gas from deep within the earth, uh, and then they ship it to other countries and a couple billionaires get richer. And um, there is controversy surrounding it because water wells have been contaminated. I did a media ecology study on how all that was working in the city of Pittsburgh. What I found out was that economic articles outnumbered environmental articles by about five to one. Uh, I also found out that in 2011, there were over 2,000 violations from the oil and gas industry 
None of them were reported on. The few that were mentioned, uh, it was very quick to blame a third party or blame a local agency involved to kind of deflect the blame from a major company like a range resources or a console. And both of those companies infiltrated the city completely. They advertised with local and larger media. They, uh, I mean, the Penguins play in the console energy center. The Steelers are sponsored by range resources. Even when you go into the city, there's a sign that range resources has advising people not to litter, which, which a company like range resources advising people not to litter, that's like Bill Cosby telling people not to catcall. But that's a different story for a different day. So there's just, and the other thing I wanted to talk about quickly, because in a lot of ways what you guys are doing is a social movement, is the way the media treats social movements. Todd Gitlin, uh, who was a theorist from back in the day, was writing about students for democratic society. He laid out the groundwork of how the media treats social movements. First they trivialize it, then they marginalize it, and then they kind of just antagonize it and write it off. And you've seen this time and time again. You saw it with Occupy. First, it was just trivial. It wasn't a big deal. Then when they started covering it, you know, they didn't focus on Noam Chomsky or, or any of the musicians or the activists. They focused on the person that was dressed up as a tent. Uh, and then they kind of just write, wrote it off completely. You saw this in the Black Lives Matters movement. Uh, they, they wrote it off as riots right away. They didn't focus on the ideas. And when they did, they didn't focus on any of the peaceful protests that were going on in, in pretty much every pocket in the world. The sound soundbite that you saw circulating the most was the soundbite of the one group, the one group that did the dead cop chant, the one group that did that. Uh, so you see social movements being treated this way. Why does that happen? That happens because the main corporate media likes upholding the status quo, because the people that own that are benefiting from it. Nothing threatens the status quo more than a social movement, hence they are seen as the other. Now. One thing I want to bring up here, sometimes people throw the free market argument in my face, like, Ron, this is capitalism, deal with it. Interestingly enough, friends, this is not the media structure we've always had in this country. This was not the media structure that was ever intended in this country, ever. Uh, prior to the 20th century, our media was you know, primarily newspapers. And newspapers were founded upon different schools of political thought. The idea of objective journalism didn't really exist yet. So constitutionalists, federalists, socialists, these were all groups that had their own newspapers. An average metropolitan area had about 10 different newspapers. Newspapers were distributed via the postal service. What the government did, because being civically engaged was considered important in this country, I mean, Thomas Jefferson even said if he had to live in a society with newspapers and no government, or government and no newspapers, he'd prefer newspapers and no government. So what the government would do, they would subsidize postage costs if you were a newspaper. So you could get your newspaper published and circulated regardless of your financial or economic power. The phrase freedom of the press used to refer to that. Freedom of the press doesn't just mean the freedom to like publish stuff without fear of violence from a group. That's part of it. But freedom of the press also referred to accessibility to the media. It meant that if you had a body of ideas, a perspective, you could get your ideas out there regardless of your financial power. That part of freedom of the press has been written out of our history books because that part of freedom of the press has pretty much been lost. But the one redeeming thing here, guys, is that we have the technology and the know-how to take it back. So let's get to the part where what can we do? How can we be part of the solution? Uh, first of all, these are issues that need to be discussed. I know it's kind of a cliche to say raise awareness, but in this case, it's actually very applicable. A lot of people aren't aware of these things, and a lot of people get engaged more when they talk to their neighbor or when a particular event makes them question why is stuff going on? Why are things this way? For me, it was the Iraq war when I was in college. For other people, Maybe it was the 08 election or the 2012 election. Maybe it's going to be the election in 2016. Uh, but I encourage people to read more critically. I encourage people to question what's going on around them uh, because I really feel that the change is already occurring. Because I, you know, we, we mentioned real change earlier in the program. Real change, the way I see it, does not occur just by passing a piece of policy or, or just by something like that. Real change occurs when a group of people, through their daily actions, 
decides that a status quo isn't working anymore and start acting in that way. When that occurs, policy will follow. And I think that that behavior is already happening in this country. People are already thirsty for other news. That's why alternative and independent outlets are thriving in this country, especially here in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm affiliated on YouTube with the Young Turks. We just did Politicon recently. It was uh, spectacular. Every seat was full. And organizations like that are going on in this country. They are thriving. I also do a radio show. That whole thing is part of the LPFM movement. What that was, was that was a response to the Telecommunications Act of 1996, when the Telecommunications Act uh, lifted all regulations on how many stations one group could own. The LPFM movement stepped in to kind of get more diversity on the radio. There are limitations because industry fought it, but it's still going on. And there's other organizations that I have listed here. Freepress.net, which is committed to media reform, which is also largely responsible for why we still have net neutrality in this country. We almost lost it. Uh, Project Censored, Democracy Now!, uh, that's the Prometheus Radio Project, that's the National Association for Media Literacy, and Magnet. So there are organizations committed to spreading these ideas. So I encourage you to be involved, I encourage you to kind of be the media. Uh, because one thing that's also true is that uh, I really feel, and I want to share you this story and then I'm going to get out of here, this determined the 2012 election. Uh, and a lot of times in, in elections, there's so much going on at you, especially presidential election, uh, that one event really changes it. And some of you guys might remember in 2012, Mitt Romney was speaking to a group of his friends, and he made the 47% comment. He made the comment that 47% of these people, uh, these people being Americans, don't want to work, they don't want to do this, they don't want to do that. There was a guy working behind the bar that heard this and thought it wasn't right, so he turned on his camera phone. Then he logged into YouTube. Then he posted it on YouTube. And despite the billions of dollars that people spend on these elections uh, every cycle, one dude with a phone pretty much determined who was gonna win that year. So yes, we can be the media. And when it comes to the media structure, this is not the structure we had. This is not the structure we need and we can do better. Let's do better. Come say hi to me later, and thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ron, for that. Uh, and now we're gonna switch gears. I'd like everyone to take a deep breath. We're gonna take a couple minutes just for you, and we will welcome Sarah Barker, who's had a meditation practice for 15 years to the stage to guide us in a guided meditation. Sarah. All right, thank you. All right, good morning. So uh, if I could just ask everyone to uh, go ahead and put both your feet on the floor. And you might want to scoot just a little bit up in your chair so that you have a nice, relaxed, but upright posture. And go ahead and just close your eyes. So what we're going to do today is a, a little meta meditation. Meta meditation is compassion, loving kindness, and compassion meditation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this gong up here, and I ask that as you listen to the sound of the gong, that you focus on that sound, pay attention to that sound, until you can no longer hear the sound. Now what we're going to do is notice the breath. Breathing is one thing that we do naturally. We don't need to think about it. We can sink into it. It will happen. We don't need to control it. So simply pay attention to your breath. The feeling of the breath coming in through your nostrils.
paying attention to the breath as you exhale. Meditation is about concentration. That's all that it is, concentration. If your mind begins to wander to thoughts of what you'll do later, to what you thought about the wonderful speaker, to the temperature of the room, what we call monkey mind, simply return your attention to your breath. Meditation is like training a puppy. You don't beat it. When it makes a mistake, you simply lead it back to the behavior that you want it to experience, and that's what we're doing here. So if your mind wanders, return your attention to your breath. If you feel any tension in the body, in your shoulders, in your back, your neck, relax. And breathe into that part of your body. What I want you to do now is to imagine the size of this room, full of people. People from all walks of life, all demographics. People that are just like you. Pull this room of people into your mind. Visualize the room of people. If your mind takes you off somewhere, outside of what we're doing now, simply gently return your attention to your breath. And now we'll bring in the loving kindness meditation. Imagining the room of people I'm going to give you a couple of sentences now and just repeat them in your mind as you hold that image of this room full of people. Bring this thought into your meditation. May you be happy. May you be happy. May you be at peace. May you be at peace. May you be free from suffering. May you be free from suffering. Know that you can do this meditation anytime, anywhere. This grounding meditation can remind us that when it comes to suffering, we're all exactly the same. And we can wish each other well. So when you're ready, gently open your eyes. Thank you. I'd like to invite my singers to come on back up. song. Some of you may have learned it from Kermit the Frog. Some of you may have learned it from Willie Nelson. 
Why are there so many songs about rainbows? And what's on the other side? Rainbows are visions and only illusions. And rainbows have nothing to hide. So I've been told and some choose to believe it. I know they're wrong. Lovers, the dreamers, and me. Oh, you sound good. Throw a little harmony on it this time. Who said that every wish would be heard and answered when wished on a morning star? Somebody thought of it, and someone believed it. What's so amazing that keeps us stargazing? What do we think we might see? Someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. All of us under spell, we know that it's been half asleep? Have you heard voices? I've heard them calling my name. This is the sweet sound that calls the young sailor. The voice could be one and the same. I've heard it too. La 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 Okay, that's my favorite song. I love that so much. I love that movie. It makes me teary. Um, I love that song almost as much as I love the next person I'm inviting on the stage. I'm going to invite Lori Nolan to come up. She's going to do a segment that we call Doing Our Best. You may know her because you all see her. She greets you. First person you see when you come in. So Lori, please join us. Wow. You guys look good from up here. <laughs> I really love this topic of being a part of a solution. And I don't know about you, but it can often feel really overwhelming to figure out how to do that when we're walking around out in the world on a day-to-day -day basis. I first came to Sunday Assembly a year ago next month, a year ago in November, and I was really excited to find a non-religious community that was all about live better, help often, and wonder more. I mean, is that not the coolest motto? <laughs> I really love that. The reason that sounded so good to me is I used to be part of a community that was similar in a lot of ways. I discovered and joined that community when I was 20, and I was very active in it until my mid-30s. That community was the Mormon church. One of the great perks of being a Mormon, <laughs> not where you'd expect me to go with this talk probably, but one of the great perks that I enjoyed with finding the Mormon faith was the smorgasbord of volunteer opportunities that were always around the corner. I got to work with the youth. We got to hike the Zion Narrows. With, you should never do that with people that are like 10 years younger than you, by the way. <laughs> I got to go visit uh, seniors that I never would have met otherwise and made some really great relationships. And I felt like I always had many, like sometimes too many opportunities to be of service and to really make a difference. When I left the Mormon Church, I basically had to walk away from that smorgasbord of volunteer opportunities. I've been out of that church for 20 years now. 
And for a lot of that 20 years, I was looking for this kind of community. I swore I wasn't going to do this. <laughs> and over that 20 years, I'd pretty much given up on ever finding it again. It felt like a missing for me for a long time. So last November, when I came to Sunday Assembly for the first time, the very first thing I did was see the community table, and I stopped there to see, well, what's this group up to? What kind of opportunities would I have to get more involved than just showing up at a meeting once a month? And I was drawn immediately to the Let's Read program. Let's Read is a tutoring program for disadvantaged elementary and middle school students at a large public housing complex in South LA. After all, my career has been solidly in the business world, but my major was child development. And after leaving the church and not having that kind of foundation to work from, I didn't get to work with kids anymore. So I loved the idea of going into working with kids. I also learned that a few Sunday assembly members had already been volunteering there for quite a long time, like Frank and John, who you see her every week. And they, so when I would go, I would find a friendly face. So I started volunteering there this past March, and it's been great. The kids come, 25 to 35 kids come every week, every Saturday that's going, and they do 10-week sessions. And they really are eager to learn. You would not think that about little kids, but they really are eager, eager to learn. The first two that I worked with were Lupe and Laura. They're cousins, and they're both in third grade, and they both live there at Pueblo del Rio, but they told me that they hardly ever got to see each other. So one of the things that I did with Lupe, she loved to write, but her spelling needed a little work. So I taught her how to make a word, find a word puzzle using the months of the year. You know how hard it is to spell some of the months of the year? So she spelled them out and then put them in a find a word puzzle and was so excited to give that to Laura who solved it. And now I've seen them do those puzzles back and forth a little bit with each other. So they get to practice their spelling in a really fun way. Something that makes this even more meaningful for me is later I learned what a difference Sunday Assembly as a community made for that program. How we got involved in it in the first place was our illustrious co-founder Amy Boyle found out about Let's Read and thought, huh, well this new community we're forming, maybe there's people there that would want to get involved. And so she plugged it in and our volunteers started going. What she learned later from the director is that that program, which had been going for 20 years, was about to fold because of lack of volunteers. If Sunday Assembly people hadn't started volunteering, it might not be going. So it feels very, very good to have found a community that I wasn't sure I'd find again. Thank you. What time is it, Amy? <clears throat> well, Gina, it's time for a little segment we call The Collection. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That sounds exciting and fun. Yeah, well, here's what it lets us do. <laughs> <laughs> the Collection is how we can rent the venue uh, and pay for our insurance and the website and our QuickBooks and the babysitters uh, for Sela kids who are the only people in all of Sunday Assembly Los Angeles who get paid. Uh, so that we can offer free childcare uh, every every month. That sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even though I am a monthly donor, every time I come to Sunday Assembly, I feel what Lori just expressed, the, the love and the importance of this community. So I like to, um, you know, always dig a little deeper in my pocket. <laughs> and I'm going to donate this 20 right now. So if somebody with a box wants to come get this. Okay, well, I'm going to not. Yeah? I'm not going to let you show me up, so... Oh. oh, look at that. I got... She always has to one-up me. Always. Whoa! Thank you, Dave. <laughs> so, um, we are going to do our collection now. The, the boxes are being passed around. If you would prefer to use a debit card or credit card, we have square readers as well. You just raise your hand and the square peoples will... There's one right over here. There's one in the back, Noah. Here, we got squares over here. We would say that three the, on the floor, three on the floor. The, the square people aren't actually square, but I mean, most of us are. Us over here, so. there we go. 
Awesome. If you look around and you see people with the green badge, that means that they're a monthly donor, um, which is something super easy to do. You can do it on our website. Um, you can also um, donate through a credit card at our merchandise table later if that's more convenient for you. And any, anyone at home, if you wanted to stop by our website, you could also <laughs> kick, kick a couple dollars our way, keep, keep, us, keep us in venues. Uh, okay, so while we're waiting for our volunteer ushers to get around the room with those boxes, I want to talk uh, for a couple minutes about volunteers. Yeah, they're, very important. There are a lot. There's a giant team that goes into bringing you not just this assembly, but the dozens of events, service projects, social events, and other special uh, seasonal holiday events that we do throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we just want to call out some names um, of some of the amazing people that keep things running. Um, I want to start out with our greeters, our ushers, our setup, our coffee, our breakdown. Not all these people are here today and not all of them serve every time, but these are some of the folks that rotate through. Um, Sarah, Ross, Amy C, Ben, Connor, Joe, Peyton, Sean, Tony, Alexis, Dave, Randy, Amy V, Shannon, Jessica, Philip. Janet, Liam, Aaron, Krishan, Reed, Lori, Sergio, Margot, Courtney. Also Ryan and Owen, Sean, Terry S, Scott, Alan, Pam, Rick, Amy V. We have a lot of people with the same names, first names. Terry W, um, Mark, Kendall, and Frank. Uh, at the merchandise table and handling our inventory every single month is Holly. Uh, we are volunteer bookkeeper also every month quietly behind the scenes Chris our social media team Which is new consists of Cole Sean Oscar and Noah. That's going really well We're getting a lot of coverage that way um, Sunday assembly kids Aaron handles that and our um, new art enrichment program Christine um, Sean Les and Russell we also have a lot of people who host events uh, throughout the month. Some of them include Sarah, Amy, Tony, Ian, Dave, and myself. I host a lot of events, as well as Molly, Aaron, Reed, Russell, Margo, Jeff, Terry, and many more people. The video team, David, Steve, Bruce, Michael, Reed, Rhonda, Oscar, James, and our talent committee, um, who helps to organize all the great people who come to the stage, um, Ryan, Amy, Ian, myself, and Terry. Can we give all of those people a round of applause? Yeah. We love you. We love you so much. It's a huge help to everyone who contributes in any way, including coming here every month. We really appreciate it. The, the thing that we are always the most short on uh, and that really gives us the power to do more and provide more for the community is always time. Uh, so even though it seems like we have a huge number of people, and we do, uh, we're always looking for more talented, committed people. So you can ask us or, or check out the website. But thank you, thank you for everyone who, who has given. Yeah, and we also have a Help Often team, and you can learn more about that at the community table in the lobby when you go out. Right, those are people who volunteer for the service projects, like what Lori was talking about. Uh, so before we move on to the next uh, section, I just wanted to talk for a second about you know, some of the things I was thinking about um, to earlier and today, that you know, even when we're, we're thinking about those really big issues like the uh, seemingly intractable issue of our media being uh, driven by profits that are misaligned with ethics uh, and the you know, way that our education system is so badly failing our kids, especially kids who are living in poverty, like the kids at Pueblo del Rio, um, that there's always something uh, that we can do, like talk to our neighbors and make sure that we explore alternative uh, forms of media, uh, volunteer on Saturday mornings uh, to work with kids for, with, you know, word finds like Lori does. Uh, and that, that even up against the really, really big problems, like, like, like probably the biggest problem you can think of, like the Holocaust, we have Martin Niemöller uh, in the, the poem that Marcia shared today, you know, who, who stood up with words that have come back you know, throughout over and over in the face of tyranny. You know, the, those words have helped remind us to speak up for each other. Um, so we don't have to solve everything to be a part of something. Uh, and I think that that's, that's really what the gist of what everyone is trying to share with you today. Uh, and, and when being part of the solution becomes exhausting, and it does, 
uh, we have community and we have each other to lean on uh, and sigh with and sing silly songs with so we can build each other up and, and get out there and do it again. So thank you uh, for being a part of this um, with us because this is definitely where I come uh, to recharge and remind myself you know, what matters and that I, that I need to get out there and, and take those everyday actions that are going to add up, I hope, to making an impact. Uh, and thank you for being part of the solution and, and being part of our community. Yeah, awesome. So my favorite way to recharge with silly songs, um, which we're gonna do that really soon. But before we get to that, we have some closing announcements that we wanna make. Um, our next assembly is going to be on November the 8th, and um, I'm gonna kick off, uh, hopefully by not messing up this name, um, Dr. Fouad Dizaji Bamani. That sounds right. Yeah. Okay, awesome. He's, he's <laughs> great, he's great. You don't have to say his name like I just did. Um, he was gonna be speaking on the three ways that science explores the concepts of parallel universes. Oh, do, 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 also, do. he's gonna be making ice cream. Okay, yeah. so you don't wanna miss that. That's in your great assembly. <laughs> Oh, it's probably me, huh? Sunday yeah. Social. Yeah. Sunday Social. Uh, on this coming Sunday, we're going to the Craft Folk Art Museum at 12 o'clock, uh, which is still plenty of time to get to... Is that 12? Yes, okay. Yeah, to get to Foundation. the Garden Foundation. Uh, I think the Craft Museum is 5 or $7 or pay what you can. Um, still time to get to the Garden Foundation Service Project that is also on Sunday at 2.30, just a couple miles away. Uh, if you're wondering what that is, why? It is one of our most popular service projects, but they need your RSVPs by today. So if you're interested in being a part of the Garden Foundation, please RSVP either in our lobby or online by today to participate at 2.30 on Sunday. And um, quick note, in your um, program, there are a whole lot of events listed there, so take that home with you. It does say that the Arts and Crafts Museum is at 11 and not noon, but it's we not think true. it's noon. Mm -mm. So it's noon. Molly's here, and you can check in at the community table if you have questions about that. Um, we have some other really cool upcoming events that I want to mention. We have been serving um, food with the Greater West Hollywood Food Coalition, which is um, you know really close to this area. It's a really rewarding experience and a chance to like really talk to people as well as give them a, a healthy meal. Um, our next event for that is October the 24th. It's at 5.45 p.m. You can sign up for that online. Um, we are also having a costume Halloween party, which I cannot wait for. And there are going to be prizes. <laughs> Um, that's going to be the night before Halloween, so if you're planning on spending Halloween with your kids, you can still do that. You can come to the party in Venice. Um, you have to have a costume to get in, and Amy, for those who show up without costumes, has a plan. Uh, so we had, my husband and I had a uh, costumed wedding a few years ago, and we have about 200 hats left over. So if you can still come if you don't have a costume or you don't have time for a costume, but you will be handed a hat. I will be costuming door. you as you come in the door. If you're late, you might not get to choose, you know, True. from the True. full 200. Um, we're also excited to celebrate our first annual winter solstice celebration. We're really stoked about that. That's going to be on December 19th here in the hall. We've already got a ton of signups yeah, for that. It's, it's really cool. Big. So you can sign up for that online as well. We have tons of other service and social events on the website. Check them out. There's not enough time to talk about them all here. Uh, but please don't forget about that special event on Tuesday at CF that we're co-hosting about the non-religious people in the military. Uh, Jason Torpy, the president of Military Atheist, uh, Association of Atheists and Freethinkers, will be there, and he's not in town very often, so this is a pretty special event. It's going to be great. Um, so uh, we did not recognize one very important group of volunteers, which is our organizing committee, and we're going to do that now. Um, we're going to... Um, We'll help you put faces to names. Amy and I have had this conversation before. We go to other assemblies and we wonder, like, oh, you know, who do we chat about? How, like, that oh, music was awesome. How do we steal Paul? Who are these people? You know, that kind of thing. How right? did this assembly get here? <laughs> Someone must have created it. Yeah, so just... we, we thought we would <laughs> ask those people to come to the front so everyone can see who they are. I'm going to call out those names. We're going to call those out together. And um, we'll ask them to stay up here and join us for the final song. Amy? Oh, oh, right. So uh, the first two organizers are us. Uh, I, I'm going to introduce her by name, though. If you don't know her already, you're missing out. This is Gina, who is the chair. Gina is the chair of our talent committee, uh, but her real title is 
tornado of fun. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, thank you. Um, And Amy is our co-director and co-founder of Sunday Assembly Los Angeles. Okay, I have always wanted to be on The Price is Right, but I never had the opportunity. So we're going to ask these people to come on down. We have two people who can't come on down. Michael Lewis, who is our IT webmaster, and he also is the mastermind of running the PowerPoint and all this other fancy stuff. He's over here in the corner, and he cannot leave his station. He's too important. Um, James Whitker, who's our video coordinator, also too important to come on down. He's busy. Molly Knute, who's our social Sunday lead. Molly, come on, come on down, down, Molly. Let's do it. <laughs> Sarah Molly, Sandberg, Molly, who isn't Molly. here today, she's celebrating her anniversary, but we still want to recognize her. She's our volunteer coordinator. Russell Orell, our photography and arts lead. Russell, can you come on down? No, too important, too important. Noah Wiles, who's our day of coordinator. You have to come down, Noah. Do it, Not do it. Come on. Lori Nolan, who we've already seen once, come on down. She's our name tag guru. Jeff Sargent, who is our community coordinator, please come on down. And finally, our co-director of Sunday Assembly, Ian Dodd, come on down. Yay, okay, wonder more warbler. Come on up, and now we're going to invite the kids from the kids program. You also come on down and join us for the final song. It's come on, kids! Come on, kids! Come on! You can bring your parents if you like. All right. Okay. All right. The kids come down. Now, this is a song that some of you may have learned before. It's kind of like it's kind of like. Right. Oh, good. More singers. Are all the warblers here? Yes. Warblers are all here. Uh, the rest of you who've been called down, you're now part of the warblers. So just thought we'd do a little recruiting here. Oh, and the kids are part of the warblers. We got lots of people in the warblers. Um, This is a great assembly. I really, I'm I'm honored to be here and I appreciate everybody's great singing. And they were right, you are a good singing group there. Shout out to my friends in San Diego and my son Jeremy who lives in town and came by to say hey. Whenever his son shows up to see his old man do something he knows, it's a good day. So if I do this, you'll know what to do. Mana, mana. Mana, mana. Mana, mana. That's how it goes. Manamana, do 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 do. Manamana, do 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 do. Manamana, do 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 all right, so let's see. This side do the manamana, this side do the do do do's. Ready? One, two, three, go. Manamana, do 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 do. Manamana, do 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 do. Oh, sounds good. Manamana, do 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 do. Switch! Manamana, do 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 do. Manamana, do 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 do. Manamana, do 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 do. Okay, women, you do the menomena, guys, you do the do do do, but do it in falsetto up here. Ready? Ladies, ready? One, two, three. Do 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 do. Do 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 do. Do 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 so I'm a music history buff. Some of you might have learned this song on the Muppet Show. Anybody? Muppet Show? Some of you may have learned it on Sesame Street. Anybody? A couple? Okay. 
How many of you learned it on the Red Skelton show in the 60s? We got one, two, yes, in the blackout scenes they do the Menomina. But Menomina actually came from an Italian movie called Heaven and Hell. It was a study of the erotic behaviors of Swedish women in saunas. I kid you not, I, I sacrificed myself and watched the movie. <laughs> Except they sang it differently. They'd go, Menomina, dee 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 dee. Menomina, bee dee dee dee. Come on. Menomina, bee dee bee dee 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 Do it again now. Menomina, bee dee 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 dee. Menomina, bee dee dee dee. Menomina, bee dee 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 dee. Okay, we're gonna do it again. I'm gonna do the menomena. I want you to do anything except do or D. Ready? Menomena. 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 One more time! Menomena. Menomena. Come on now. Menomena. Stand up and sing it again. Menomena. Okay, bring it down, bring it down. Menomena, do do, snap your fingers. Menomena, do 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 do. Menomena, do 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 do. Once more. Menomena, do 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 do. Menomena, do Menomena, do 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 do. Thank you everyone until next time. Live better. Help often. Wonder more.